were particularly uh, known for their scrupulous following of the rules and regulations of the law as they had uh, spelled them out. And beyond what the 613 precepts that they came up with about the, with the law of Moses, there was also another collection of laws and rules that they followed. And those were these, these, these ideas about how to wash and what had to be washed and how it had to be washed or refined. And so, you know, this wasn't about hygiene, you know, even though perhaps in the initial phases people did that because they knew that they needed to clean the stuff off their hands. But it became this religious regulation, and so they had, when they washed their hands, they had to wash up to the elbow. Uh, you know, maybe sometimes today people would advise us to do the same thing. But it was a regulation that they had to follow. And, you know, washing the food that they got from the marketplace was probably a wise idea, but it was a regulation, and if they didn't do it, then it would defile them. Similarly with eating with the unwashed hands. And then the whole business about washing you know, uh, the uh, kettles and, and everything else, um, that was done not because they were dirty and needed to be clean, but they were washed before they were used because it was feared that maybe somebody had used those vessels for cooking something that was not permitted for them to eat, or boiled something, or made something to drink that was forbidden to them. And so to make sure that they didn't contaminate themselves, making themselves ritually impure, uh, so that they wouldn't miss anything in the synagogue, or when they needed to go to the temple, they had all those regulations. And so Jesus zeroes in on that behavior because that becomes as important, if not more so, than loving God and loving their neighbor. They became totally obsessed with the perfect observance of the law and everything that went along with it. But the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy, they would fall down on time and time again. That's because what St. James says in the, uh, the second lesson today was something that even though it grows out of the Jewish understanding of what it meant to be a faithful follower of Yahweh, that you had to put your faith into practice. It wasn't enough just to talk a good game. You had to be able to play it. And so that's why James goes to the extent that he does throughout his letter to try to point out to people their inconsistencies. How in that early Christian community they were practicing all kinds of discrimination. Even though they didn't think they were doing anything wrong because they hadn't fully grasped yet what the gospel was about. They were acting out of their old behavior and they needed to be shaken out of that and shown that, you know, that real religion was enacted by acts of compassion and mercy and generosity, not by following regulations scrupulously to the point of ignoring the higher calling to, law, uh, to the law of mercy and justice and compassion. And so that was the ongoing struggle. And it continues even in the church in various places 
today where sometimes we can get hung up on what's the right way to do something. I mean, as I was looking at something even this morning, it said, you know, which way the acolyte lights the candles uh, or how the, the acolyte extinguishes the candles can become, uh, you know, a, a major issue for some people. Or how we decorate the church or how we do almost anything that we do can become something that people latch on to and get angry about and maybe stop going to church for because you didn't do it the way it's supposed to be done. Now, of course, there are times when we do certain things and we follow a certain pattern, the ritual of the prayer book, etc., because this is what the church has given to us and this is what, how we end up being able to connect and feel a part of because if we reinvented things week by week, it would be confusing at the best. And at the worst, we would just stop coming because we wouldn't know what to expect from one week to the next. At least we as Episcopalians expect certain things when we come to church. And when those things don't happen, that's when we become uncomfortable and maybe get angry. We're not talking about essentials. We're talking about more peripheral things. Or if we don't do something just right, then somebody gets angry about it and lets us know how we have messed up their life, their day, uh, you know, and probably unbalanced the whole universe in the process. Many of us can say how we have lost our tempers with people when they didn't do things the way we thought they should have done them. But this is not just about moral behavior here or about peripheral kinds of things. It's to continuously call to mind that Jesus asks us to look beyond sometimes the obvious to what is going on underneath. You know, we can look at one another, and we, if we stay on the surface, which many times, you know, we, we probably try to do, because we don't want people either probing or getting into our business. But when we stay on the surface, we have better control of the situation. But what Jesus asks us to do as disciples is not to be nosy, but to be concerned and not to always take things at face value. Because if Jesus took things at face value, he would have never said anything at all. But he could see the results of how these leaders of the people had such a devastating effect on the lives of the people that shared the faith with them. Because a lot of these people didn't have the luxury of being able to bathe themselves continuously before they did something. Because of the kind of life that they had to lead. Or that they didn't have the, the ability to just purify these vessels over and over and over again, just in case. Or any of the other things. Because they did not have that luxury. And because they were looked down upon, because they were judged, they're shoved aside. And though many of them concluded that they could never love Yahweh the way Yahweh demanded to be loved, that they could never come close to the one who had drawn close to them and called this people together. And the one thing that we have is that we know by faith how much we are loved by the Lord, how much Christ wants to be a part of our life, and how much he does in order to realize that. And what we're being called to do again and again 
is from that experience of being drawn into the very life of God, from the moment of our baptism until this present moment now, that what we are being drawn into is an opportunity to share what we have. James is on the case of the Christians because they are being judgmental. They are also being stingy. And they're discriminating among the people who come to their community. And so you and I are being called to see the needs in others, to be able to relate to the people on the level of the heart and not just on the level, you know, on the surface, but to try to understand one another, try to practice this in our daily life, to go beyond what we hear and maybe look more deeply into what we, we feel we we are sensing in somebody else that maybe God's way of saying say something to this person or offer to do something for them or be concerned about that group over there rather than just about yourself it's like I have felt a particular conviction again lately about doing something more for our persecuted brothers and sisters, particularly in the Middle East. And what to do, I'm not sure. But I keep saying, you know, well, you know, I, I don't have time to deal with that now. I gotta do something else. You know, we need a janitor, we need a new Christian ed director. Those things are are you know more pressing. But yet it doesn't this this call doesn't go away. It's that kind of thing that I'm talking about. So that we are not bound by <clears throat> certain rules and regulations, particularly those things that we erect for ourselves that keep us maybe focused on what we want to do, but we miss what God called us to do. So, the great lover of humankind this God of ours that we hear described in the words in Solomon, the Song of Solomon today, is the one who continuously calls us to open our minds, open our hearts, open our hands, to respond more generously to people who are around us, to take the risk of maybe asking a question or of offering to do something or volunteering get involved in something so that the love of God isn't just pent up in us but is released through our works, through our deeds, through our words, through our caring. And that way the compassion and the love of God becomes something real and not just something on a page or pent up just to make us feel good. The Eucharist is that reminder to you and me of the importance of giving what we have received. That Jesus gives us his very self to be our food, to be our drink, to be our strength, so that we then have something more to give, namely his love. <clears throat> 